All right, it is three after the hour. Why don't we go and get started? I assume you guys can see my screen okay, right? I'll take that as a yes. All right, move forward. So uh, I don't think there's anything special to mention on the AIs. When Austin gets on, uh, if I don't remember, please somebody remind me. We need to nag him to set up the next SDK call. Um, community time. So for those of you who are new, um, this is a time when people who don't normally join the group can bring up topics for discussion. Uh, is there anybody on the call who's new that would like to bring up a topic? And Josh, I already have your topic added to the agenda, I believe. Anybody else? All right, moving forward then. Um, without Austin here for the SDK, I don't think anything's really happened there other than the Golang SDK repo that VMware was working on was just officially moved over this morning to our org in GitHub. Um, so if there's anybody on the call who would like to be added as a maintainer to any of the SDKs, uh, please let me know, because as of right now, I think I've only added one person as a maintainer on, on one of the projects. And obviously we need more, because otherwise nothing's gonna get done. So please let me know if you wanna actually work on those. And um, now's the time to jump in as a maintainer while there's nothing there. Um, Kathy, I don't see her on the call. So I don't think anything's happened there though, relative to the workflow subgroup. Um, she joined, I'll ask her again. So in, if I forget, someone please remind me, but I don't think anything's happened there. Um, we did have a meeting relative to the Shanghai KubeCon sessions. You can see the links to the uh, document and the slides that we're working on. Um, mainly Kathy, Clemens, and myself will be doing some presentations for the intro and deep dive. I don't think there's a whole lot of stuff in there right now. I think Kathy's the only one that's actually added some information to the slides. But um, whether you're going or not, feel free to review those. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, please speak up and we'll try to get them accommodated. Um, interop work. Um, I haven't heard a whole lot from anybody about the interop demo that we're trying to do for KubeCon uh, Seattle. Uh, so what I wanna do is try to force the discussion. So I will be sending out a doodle poll, um, unfortunately, um, due to travels and stuff, I need to make it end kind of early. So expect the doodle poll to come out later this afternoon, but I will shut it down uh, by end of business tomorrow with the hopes that we can maybe have a meeting early next week to start talking about the interop demo. Okay, so just a heads up, keep an eye out for a doodle poll note. All right, and with that, I think we can now jump into PR stuff or discussions. So um, last time we were talking about casing of our properties. And we had, I think, at least four different options in front of us. Now, Clemens, you closed one this morning, uh, 327, I believe. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you closed that one? Clemens, I can't hear you for talking. Can anybody hear Clemens or oh, is it just me? How, how about this? There you go. That's better. Thank you. Yeah, the, the microphone didn't work, apparently. Um, yeah, so I had uh, uh, two PRs, which we basically we went through them last time, um, which are effectively the same, but the second one, um, and the first one here on the list, effectively introducing the underscore character and then um, you know, separating all the terms with underscores. And it ended up looking very super clunky, I think. Um, and uh, to effectively limit the choices unless someone uh, really, 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 really wants to insist on the underscores, um, then I can go and revive it. Um, but so this is the one, yes. So I closed that one um, because ultimately I think the, the one where we have simply restricted the character set to lowercase characters um, serves the purpose and if we're doing a further cleanup of names where we strike like the event prefix, et cetera, um, then legibility is not going to be that terrible. Um, and um, so I, I'm basically retracting the underscore alternative. Okay. And someone on last week's call, it may have been Tim, I can't remember, <clears throat> mentioned that some web servers have problems with underscores. So I did a quick search this morning and I did find this link um, I stuck into the agenda doc that talks about um, some issues that some servers like Nginx has with them, you can tell it to support it, but you have to go out of your way to support it. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little bit of yeah. additional information. And, and, then, and, and then if we if we allow them and then we have to go to remap for HTTP, then like we're, so no matter what separator we use, 
we're running into um, different tastes that languages and infrastructure have with the separators. Um, so that's why I'm favoring having none. Um, and then we have the same issue with case holding. And that's why I'm favoring we only have lowercase characters and that's how we avoid most of the, the, the problems. Um, I, I, I understand people's um, uh, you know, desire for legibility, et cetera, uh, but ultimately it's about interoperability. And uh, with the least common denominator approach, um, we can achieve maximum uh, legibility, uh, uh, interoperability um, at the price of some uh, legibility, which is ultimately alleviated by having an SDK that then you know, seems native to uh, um, the respective runtime environment where it can be Pascal cased or um, can be Camel cased, et cetera. Okay, so let, let me go ahead and pick on Joshua because Joshua, you had opened up, I believe this is just an issue, not a PR, about promoting or uh, suggesting the idea of a snake case thing using underscores. Would you like to talk to that at all? Um, <clears throat> I mean, if we go all lowercase, then that solves my issues. So nothing to add, really. Uh, our, my, my issue was, was like uh, Clemens was saying, uh, some of our databases don't, you know, are not case sensitive. And so then we would have um, a little bit of difficulty in terms of these long, you know, field names that would kind of get munched um, once they all became a single case. Okay. So I like the idea of reducing the choices because I think it makes any kind of vote we have easier. So let me ask this question. Does anybody have any objection or concerns with Clemens closing 327, which is the one that adds the notion of uh, allowing an underscore? My only concern is that some people did point out that they would rather have underscores. So nothing else. So I guess what I'm wondering then with that comment, um, are there other people on the call? Well, let me put it this way. Are there people on the call who would like to advocate for having an underscore character in there, in essence, reopening 327 and making that one of the choices for a, for a vote? I don't. I've been um, somewhat curious what if the conversation would be all that different if it were a dash, but I, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion here. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think you would find more system problems with dashes. Okay. So I'm not hearing anybody asking for 327 to be reopened. Um, in that case, am I correct in my assumption that we're basically then back to, I guess, I want to say two choices, but technically it's three because we could choose to do nothing and leave it as is. Uh, but the two alternatives for making changes are 317, which is camel case, and 321, which is lowercase everything with no underscores. Um, I believe those are the two choices in front of us. Um, Christoph, would you like to talk to 317? I think you might have missed last week's phone call where we were talking about this. So I, you didn't get a chance to really advocate for 317, I don't believe. I actually was there last week, uh, but we ran out of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I don't, before we kind of start uh, arguing, maybe. <laughs> I want to say that uh, I opened the first PR and my main concern was that the uh, spec currently doesn't really define what a character set is, that it allows white space control characters and so on. And it doesn't define how HTTP headers look. And I think it's good that we now have two PRs to choose from and they both address these concerns. So I'm also super happy if uh, Clement's PR gets merged. I think it addresses the same things and that's really a big step forward. So that's the big, big picture for me. Interesting. That said, um, I still prefer a camel case. It looks nicer. And so what I did is um, basically I didn't touch any of the uh, attribute names. I kept them as camel case, but I restricted the character set to ASCII. I disallowed basically anything that is not an alphanumeric character. Um, the difference to Clemens is that I uh, or the difference is basically that uh, I still allow the case sensitivity. Yeah. And 
that's basically it for the main spec. And then the question is, how do you do it in the uh, HTTP layer, which is actually, I think, the only transport layer. Maybe someone can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all other transport layers that we currently support uh, su also support case sensitivity. So then the uh, the HTTP headers are the only ones that don't. Um, and so here the kind of the convention in HTTP headers is is that you separate words by dash. So I try to build a simple algorithm that says if there is a dash uh, in front of a character, you have to treat it as uppercase. And if it, if there's no dash, it should be lowercase. Um, and given that we are in the SK character set, it is actually uh, fine with case folding, I'd say. Case folding is a big mess if you're in U of eight, but since we're with SK, it should all work out. Yep, that's, I think, everything I want to say to it. Okay. Are there any questions for Christoph on his suggestion here? Okay. In that case, let's open this up for a broader discussion then. Um, are there people who would like to speak in favor or against either of the two proposals, meaning 321 versus 317, to try to convince the group one way or another? Uh, uh, this is Josh. I'll just, <laughs> yeah. I'll just say that um, you know the one of the reason that I brought up 327 um, is because you know in well I think I, I mentioned in databases in some of our databases um, there's no case sensitivity so that mapping kind of gets I know it looks better and I know camel case looks better in JSON and elsewhere but um, in some of the databases it would look very bad. Just pointing that out. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any comments? Uh, my only nit is that if we choose 317, can we please decide that the D on ID can be lowercase instead of having a dash between I and D? <laughs> we could probably do that as a follow up PR, yeah. All right. Any other persuasive comments, one way or the other? You guys are not this this uh, passive. I know you guys have strong opinions. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if no one wants to say anything, I'm of the opinion then that because we only have two choices in front of us, the choice, well, let me put it this way. Is there anybody who believes that we need to leave it as is? Okay. Not hearing that, it does sound like we have to to make some kind of change this is the group, this is consensus of the group. So it sounds like we have a Boolean choice in front of us, 317 versus 321. Um, what I'd like to do then is start a, do a formal vote. And I think per the latest governance rules, it's going to be a seven day vote. So which means it'll end the beginning of next week's call. What I'll do is I will, um, I'll put a comment into the, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have just one, one PR to, to, to look at. Um, I think I should have thought this thing through. I was, I was actually going to do a, a, a CIVS vote, but <clears throat> because I thought we had three choices. So I'll tell you what, um, I will figure out which PR to pick on um, and put a note in there asking people to vote one way or the other for 317 or 321. And you guys will have until beginning of the phone call next week to vote. Um, is there anybody who would like to vote right now? Otherwise, I was just going to wait for people that may put comments into the PR itself. Uh, this is Josh. I can vote right now for 321. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Josh. You don't have voting rights. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, oh no worries. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so of those who have voting rights, let me go back over here and um, get the link. I apologize. This is, since you're new to the group, Josh, you had no clue about the wonderful uh, bureaucracy we have. <clears throat> so anybody, any company that has a green box associated with their name uh, has a, has, can vote. Um, I'm assuming most people know whether they've been a, attending enough to know whether they can vote right now or not, since my well, machine is dead slow. I can vote for, can I vote for Microsoft? Okay, so Microsoft wants to go for I'm sorry, wait, Microsoft, you want to vote for what? 321. Okay, I was going to say, I thought you said Camel. Okay. No. 
<laughs> I'm a little confused there. Okay. Is there anybody who'd like to vote right now? Anybody else? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Chem, yeah. yeah, it's Chem. I was going to do 321 as well. Okay. PayPal, 321. Anybody else would like to vote now? You don't feel obligated. You guys can definitely wait till later. But if you want to get out of the way, feel free to speak up. Lord Strum, 321. Okay. Anybody else? Google, 321. Anybody else? All right, not hearing anybody. Um, Itaú, oh. Camel Case, Street 17. I'm sorry, that's the, uh, the, the it's Brazil Bank, right? Yeah. I, uh, I can't remember how to spell that. What is it again? I E U A. Yeah. Got it. And you said you want 317. A U. Oh. A U. Oh. Sorry. Oh. And you, you want a 317, correct? Yes. Okay, got it. All right. Anybody else would like to vote now? All right, cool. In that case, uh, please wait for the comment in, um, in the PR, and then you can vote over there. And you have until the beginning of uh, next Thursday's phone call to do that. All right. Is there any other discussion points on the case property casing issue that people would like to bring up before we move on. Okay, next, whoa. next on the agenda, uh, protobuf. I don't see Spencer on the call. Uh, Rachel or Thomas, can one of you guys talk to this or should we wait for him to be on the call? Uh, I, can, I can say some things about it if that's useful. I think um, if you had looked at this before uh, and you had made comments, your comments have probably been addressed in this version, so it's worth looking at it again. Um, this is this doesn't try to um, serialize things any differently. It doesn't try to match up JSON to protobuf in any way. Uh, so it's just dealing with protobuf. So um, take a look, see if there's anything. Like my expectation of this is that there's nothing controversial in this. Um, we'll see if that's true. Okay. I love how short it is, by the way. <laughs> it's a very short read, I liked it. Um, anybody have any questions or comments on it? Anybody have a chance to look it over? I haven't looked at it yet. Okay. Yeah, I did, I did make some relatively minor suggestions or comments in there, Rachel. Uh, maybe you can ping Spencer. I think all my, all my comments were mainly editorial or relatively minor types of things. Um, but overall, it seemed like it was okay to me. So thank you guys very much for, for doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Boy, you guys are so quiet today. This is weird. Okay, I guess we'll keep moving on then. Uh, Joshua, make event ID optional. This should be a fun one. You wanna to talk to this one? Sure. Um, yeah, so we started having some discussions on um, this issue. And um, I mean, so my, my initial feeling was probably the same as I think um, what you guys initially decided was that, hey, you know, an event ID is, is a good thing to have. Um, and then we realized that um, we, you know, we didn't, we actually didn't need it at all. We didn't want to have it because um, it would become a secondary source of truth for what is an, a unique event for us. And uh, we're one company, but um, we have, you know, one group that's mission is to um, have an accurate accounting of events that happen in the company. <coughs> And we don't necessarily, um, you know, want to. We don't want to make the effort for on the bureaucracy side to to make sure that every group that's going to be submitting events into the platform is going to create the event IDs uh, correctly. So we said, you know, there's no need for an event ID. Um, there's no need for anyone to create one because even if we're not going to necessarily trust it. So uh, for us, we just want 
you know, the data that's coming in. And as I mentioned in the original comment, um, the data uh, being who created the event, in which system at what time and what type of event it is, is enough to uniquely identify the event in every case that we have. So um, if we decide that we do want um, unique IDs uh, that are a single field, um, then what we wanna do is to create those at the platform layer, which is downstream of where the event is initially created. Uh, so that we know that we're doing it. We know exactly what the logic is uh, for creating that unique ID. Um, we know that it maps one-to-one -one on onto a certain set of fields. So that's, that's the reason this whole thing came about. Um, and I know that there's, there's definitely um, feelings that, hey, you know, having that single event ID field would make downstream some certain downstream things easier. And the, the only thing I think that, um, I mean, in addition to the deduplication reason, I think that, you know, there's another reason to have a single field event ID on there, which is that, you know, if you have a system that needs to look up an, a, an event, um, like, you know, you just want to you know, pull it up or have a URL to it or something like that, then having a single field is a good thing. Um, my contention though is that at the point where you do need the single event ID field um, you can annotate the event with that uh, with the you know but not necessarily force everyone who is producing the event to create one um, because that might just end up misleading folks so that's all I have to say about it Okay. I see some people coming off mute. Anybody want to have a question or comment? Yeah, uh, fr from the platform perspective, so from a, from a you know, intermediary middleware mes messaging perspective, uh, let's say you're producing an event and then you expect that event to pop out somewhere else and there are um, you know, three or four moving pieces and routers in the middle um, that take care of taking your event in, holding it, moving it, forwarding it, um, and then making, making it ultimately available to you, just basically for diagnostics, um, when you say, hey, I'm missing this event, and I wonder where it is, the great thing about the event ID is that it is a field that we know of because it is in cloud events, and that we will put into logs, and so that we will have in our tracing information. So if you show up, uh, at our support, um, we'll be able to use that ID to gather with um, your tenant information to go and close that event uh, and, and, and basically create that, that uh, an evidence trail to help you. If you are um, using another combination, you're effectively forcing um, us as a cloud provider to do a correlation query through you know, several trillion events at worst um, to try to find your uh, event. And so having an ID is, is fairly useful. Yeah, so, so I, I saw this argument as well. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, that makes some sense for sure. Uh, what I think about it though, is that what you're talking about is kind of like a trace ID use case. And again, I think that uh, will certainly be useful under certain circumstances, like you said, where you have complicated pipeline of um, things happening. Uh, but I think that using the event ID for the trace is not necessarily, um, I don't know, I mean, it's not necessarily the, the ideal solution um, because they're can be a more dedicated field for, for tracing. If you need one, uh, then you add it in. Yeah, but see, the, the, the point is, me as an infrastructure provider who builds generic messaging infrastructure, right? I, the point of, almost the point of why we're participating here is because we want, we want, cut, we want to have standardized, minimal metadata 
that we can rely on that everybody sends so that we can then provide services like traceability and diagnostics, et cetera, and, and, and debuggability ultimately based on top of those features. So, so you turning on extra extensions to turn on features that we have um, then becomes fairly complicated. And that's why, that's why you know, message IDs are required in um, um, uh, messaging systems. And that's why these event IDs are um, made required here because the middleware can help you with that. And, and even if it's not complicated, even if it's just a, a, you know, a topic with a, with a dispatcher, um, there you already, and you're not operating it, then you already want to have traceability. And that's, that's why the, the ID here is, uh, um, is, is required. Yeah, and just to add on to Clemens, these cases, um, event ID is also hugely important for item potency. And though it may be possible within your specific application domain to uh, build item potency on the specific events that you produce, uh, the whole point of cloud events is interop. And we, will, we want to make sure that anyone who receives a cloud event can use it for item potency. So like, uh, though it may sound a little harsh, if you want to pass around messages that are not cloud events within your system, that's fine. But like, once it actually goes to any other consumer, it should probably follow a standard convention on how to have things like item potency or identification of these envelopes. Can I, I, think can I just... I was go, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, sorry. Um, just to push on that, on maybe Clement's point a little bit, um, as these events move between providers, doesn't that tracing argument fall away there? Because it's only, a, I must admit, it's a while since I read the spec, is that event ID meant to be globally unique to everybody or unique to a publisher or unique to a client, a tenant cloud provider? I, I, I always assumed it was an ID assigned by the guy that generated it and it was just unique to them. Unique within the scope of the providers, what the spec says as of right now. The cloud provider or the provider of the event? And I guess maybe I'm overloading the term now because I think there are people on this call that would be looking to use these events, you know, or the, these structures outside of the context of a cloud infrastructure provider. I, I apologize. I, I used the wrong word. Producer, not provider. Producer. Yeah. Okay. The source, we have the source identifier and I think of the ID being, being relative to that. Right. Okay. So it's unique within that source ID. Yeah. But it, okay. Does that make it globally unique? I, and I'm just pushing on your tracing use case. To, to, together, together, it will, together it will be. Yeah. I mean, within, a, within, a cloud, within a cloud provider platform. Yes, I mean, practically speaking, we, we can also mandate that it, that it would be good. We just haven't. Right, no, I, I understand that. I, I am just trying to understand the level of uniqueness that, that this group think is applicable. Uh, I think this board, Kathy. Yeah, I think this board have a very good um, discussion. So what's uh, the unique scope? If you say this unique um, for for the event producer scope, then it might not be unique for the um, service platform scope. It won't be. It it might not be unique globally. Because how can you guarantee the, all these different producers they can cooperate well that they all use different um, event IDs? Isn't it going to be contextualized within the, the source context, like Clement said? Uh, but then again, the, the domain through which that cloud event can travel is going to be security restricted anyway. And so then that context is, is further a further boundary within which it needs to be unique. So I don't think saying it needs to be globally unique between everyone on the cloud provider um, is actually an issue because the security implications of that would be massive. So as we have these boundaries, that's where the, the uniqueness defines its context, and that's where it's needed. Um, so you are saying it's unique globally? Is that your point? I'm saying it shouldn't have to be unique globally amongst everyone within a cloud environment, but within the development, within the context, within um, of what it's interoperating with. 
if that makes sense. Mm, not really, right? Because, for example, if like for, so I'm a service platform, I, I could deal with um, over, I mean, maybe like over 10 event sources, different event sources. How could, how could I be sure those event sources, they cooperate, cooperate well, they are going to send out, you know, they are going to assign the unique um, event IDs. Because they will have yeah. unique sources in the first place. Pardon? They will have a unique source and then each unique oh, no. source is going to have a, a unique event ID. Yeah, if it's, I agree, it's unique per that um, source. But if I receive events from many different sources, and from uh, those sources belong to different event producers, different vendors, I, I don't think, you know, um, as an event consumer, as a service platform, I, I can be, you know, peace of mind, say, oh, all those event IDs are, are unique globally I and mean, all you need for per the platform scope. I, I, I think what I'm hearing um, them say though is that event ID uniqueness is scoped to the source URI. Is that correct? Yeah, to the source URI, I think that's not, is that can be um, guaranteed. But I, I'm just thinking, you know, we cannot guarantee it's unique globally or unique per um, the consumer scope, if that consumers, you know, receive events from different event sources, different event vendor producers or vendors. So, so I, I think, you know, so the usage of this event ID, although I agree it's, um, it will ease implementation, but I'm just wondering, um, actually, I think this PR raised, raised, raised a very good point. So how, I mean, what is a scope we can use it? Um, I'm not saying we should not have it, um, but I think we need to clearly define this so to avoid misunderstanding or misusage. I, I think my point was the company that, that we work with, we're never going to reach all the security considerations that are required um, if our events are, gonna, are going to be naked or non-encrypted within the context of other events which we don't trust there's always going to be some kind of security context which is trusted. And within that security context, you know who you're talking to and you know the other organisations and that's the boundary within which you have the ability to understand whether or not it's going to be unique. So it's like me, a VCP effectively. So, so let me just go to the speaker queue. Some people do have their hands up. Um, Ryan, you had a question? No, I, I don't have a question, but I sounds like someone mentioned that the producer has its own unique ID. So the consumer just concatenate the producer and the event ID. That's a global unique. Isn't that the case? So it's the combination of producer ID and the event ID is a global unique ID. When you, I, you someone, when you say producer ID, you mean the source ID, right? The source ID, yeah. Okay. Yes, it would be. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think what I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing is sort of two different discussions going on here at once. One is um, Joshua's proposal, which is to make it optional. But then there's a, the, there's a secondary discussion here, which just talks about whether the text around event ID needs to be clarified with respect to the uniqueness aspect. Um, and I think those are almost separate discussions because whether we adopt Joshua's proposal or not, I think based on what I'm hearing, it sounds like people do want a little more clarity around what the uniqueness is for the event ID. Is that a fair statement? Yes, I think okay. so. Okay, so let's take that as a follow on discussion. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll start a separate thread about that one, but let's try to circle back around to the, to the optionality aspect of event ID. Um, I'm hearing a few people say that they think it's important to be there, which is why it was required in the first place. Um, uh, is there anybody, I, I always see Joshua's on the side of keeping it optional. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in favor of making it optional? Okay. I'm not hearing a whole lot of, of uh, 
support for that position than Joshua. Is it something you'd like to pursue further by having more discussions in there or how, how do you want to no, move I, forward? I mean, I think, I think that's fair enough. Like if, you know, if you, if you want to define the cloud platform to start at the point at which the event ID is, has been defined, um, that's fine. And we'll just, we'll just keep our, our stuff that doesn't have an event ID in it um, separate from that. And if we need to use any tools um, for an interoperability sake, then we'll um, transform it into a proper cloud event uh, by creating the ID at that point. Okay. Now you said something in the introduction of your, of your issue, and it, it kind of stuck in my head. I just wanted to get some clarity. Um, when you were talking, you said something along the lines of, uh, there may be some some issue with people generating the the event ID properly, and it was mm -hmm. the notion of it being generated properly that I got a little confused by. Can you elaborate on on why people would have the difficulty? Because it's just a string; it's not even a GUID. So, what did you mean by properly? Um, well, what I mean is that um, that it has the meaning that it intend that it's intended, right? So, um, for, for instance, we mentioned somebody mentioned item potency, right? So um, if someone is, let's say, uh, generating a, a, a GUID uh, every time they make the call and, you know, they do that for each retry, that obviously wouldn't be what we expected. Um, if some, when this is something we've seen before, if people have accidentally set it to a constant value or not set it at all, and then it's a constant value, and then obviously that's not what we want. Um, so by setting it properly, that's, that's kind of what I mean. Or, you know, maybe they make it a hash of a certain set of fields, but they're not the right set of fields. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So guaranteeing the uniqueness aspect. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So then in case, and the, so in moving forward here, um, since I'm not hearing um, anybody else arguing in favor of this proposal, Am I hearing the, the consensus of the group as of right now is that we, we close this issue? I'm not hearing any objection to that. I, so, so Joshua, keep in mind that just because we may close an issue doesn't mean that we can't reopen it, especially if new data pops in. Like for example, you come across a use case that we just hadn't thought about that everybody does care about and making it required, it becomes problematic. We can definitely reopen these things. Okay, sounds okay. good. Okay, cool. Um, okay, before we move on though, is there any other comments or questions on this one before we move on? Okay, cool. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate you joining the call. Um, okay, so we have a Kafka transport binding PR out there and it's been out there for quite a while. Let's see, so August. And unless I messed up, I don't believe the author has actually commented on any of the questions, comments, or anything in here. Um, and I've asked them several times to speak up about whether they're going to address these questions or comments. I have heard back from them. I did give them sort of a little bit of a warning shot saying, you know, if you don't speak, don't mention anything by this Thursday, I'm going to propose that we actually close this. But um, what I want to first do is ask, is there anybody on the call who would like to champion this and own it going forward? I'm almost afraid to say this, but I feel that it's something we should have. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tend to agree, but without a champion, it's gonna be a little hard. So do we have somebody willing to volunteer to, to drive this one forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that on. It's Neil here. Okay, Neil. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Neil. Let me put that in the minutes. Um, I'll add a comment to the issue, or no, sorry, to the PR, saying that you volunteered to do it, and they obviously can speak up and object, but um, I think probably the best way to move forward is probably open up a follow on, or, I'm sorry, open up another PR that just picks up yeah. their commits and adds stuff to it. Um, Cause I don't think you have the access rights to actually modify their PR directly. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But thank hey, you very Doug. much. Hey Doug, Neil, this is uh, David Baldwin. Can you add me yes. to that as well? And I'll see if I can help uh, Neil out or ask me and my team help Neil out. Uh, if, if, you, if you need it, Neil, I'm not sure if you do or not, but. No, that's great. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you guys very much. I, I felt a little weird closing it, but without any movement, it was a little hard. 
So thank you guys very much. Uh, let's see, last item on the agenda. Okay, this one has actually been there for a while. <clears throat> um, from a process, I'm sorry, from a release process perspective, I don't think we we're very clear about whether we're going to version each of our documents independently from each other or bundle them all together. So what I did is put out just a straw man proposal here to suggest that basically we take all of our normative specs and the primer and group them together as a single logical unit, which means as we move to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or 1.0 or whatever, everything will get tagged with that particular version number, regardless of whether that particular doc itself has changed. That way everything is sort of at a consistent uh, SEMVER number. The only doc as of right now that would not be included in there is the uh, extension document, since that's more like a wiki page more than anything else. But it would include the main spec, the primer, the transport bindings, all those things would get lumped together. And so that, that's my proposal for how we handle versioning of our docs. What do people think? Is silence okay? Don't care? Hate it? Uh, it's, so, just, it's just that it has a lot of implications to think through. It's not that I'm not, like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> it's probably, like, is it worth thinking, like, it, it's probably worth um, laying out and being really explicit about how this works, right? Like, can, you, can you elaborate a little on what you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, so like, so like we have a lot of moving parts. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of specs right now. And thinking about like what it was like for them to, for them to like move along at their own pace or all move together through semantic versioning uh, has different implications. Like say I'm thinking about the JSON spec, the JSON spec is fine, but this other, like the proto spec needs to increment. Um, I might be miffed if I had to like continually like increment. So, so for example, um, if it, every time something increments, we increment every single thing, uh, we're going to get up to pretty high numbers pretty quickly, for example. And I don't know, it's just probably worth thinking about rather than just saying like, this looks fine. I, I think I think this is probably the right thing to do. I'm just saying we should think about it for a second. Yeah, and, and I'm not, unless everybody was saying, yeah, 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 let's do this. I, I wasn't going to actually push to resolve this one today. I just wanted to bring it up to people's attention because I, I do think we need to get this resolved at some point. Uh, so I agree with you. Definitely take some time, look this over. Uh, just to let you guys know, my biggest reason for choosing this path is because the idea of each spec being versioned independently scared me a little because of the 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 uh, what is it? What term? Or the the cross product of you know what spec of X goes with what spec of Y and which ones match up. It just sounds like it's going to be a a, a maintenance nightmare or a or a a linkage nightmare trying to keep all those things in in in, in in sync and letting people know which one could go with which spec. It just sounds like it'd be a real pain in the butt. Yeah, I wonder if we can come up with a, a process that fixes that where we don't end up in weird situations where like on one hand, I totally get the primer for version two should be associated with version two. Um, but if I add to the primer in order to help people better use version two, it's weird that that now makes version 2.1. So keep in mind that this doesn't necessarily mandate when we modify, I'm sorry, when we increment the minor version number, right? So for example, a non-normative change could technically be a, uh, what's, what's the, the third digit? The bug? It's revisional, but uh, yeah, you're, I should have given a revisional bump in the, in the example. It okay. still is a little bit weird that like we can't improve the documentation and have that show up in re the results for how to use 1.0.0. Yeah. yeah. Something to think about, yes. Okay. Um, obviously, I said, don't want to push this, so to think, take, some, to take some time to think about it. Are there other ideas that people have on the call here that they'd like to offer, up, even if it's just a, a, something you just thought of at, at, at this exact moment and hasn't been fully, fully thought through, just to get some brainstorming going? I, I think this sort of works um, because we should allow changes to documents at the minor or patch level. Yeah, so you, you're trying to group a family of things together. Yeah, and that's really, to me, the major version. I guess it's whether you you treat major and minor uh, as a, dare I say, a releasable item. 
because all those other things are really saying, yeah, I want to add a Kafka binding to version 0.1. That shouldn't change the major release of that spec family. That is true because we are trying to follow the Simver pattern. So right. everything should be backwards compatible within, within the X.Y. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's whether you want to take it to X.Y or whether you just want to take it to X. I mean, we follow our API versioning internally at PayPal follows that major version semantic. Yeah, so you, you subscribe to a major version of something and everything's compatible within that. Um, so stuff can evolve at minor or patch levels and you can add new features yeah, without, or mappings without breaking stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it's where you, where you want to pin the level of um, grouping that I think is important. So that's interesting, and I, I'm a little nervous about suggesting this, but sometimes uh, additional text for clarity's sake isn't necessarily a bad thing, even if it is a bit duplicative. Um, Semver kind of defines all this already, right? I mean, Semver basically says all minor versions are supposed to be compatible anyway, but would it be useful to call out that aspect in this definition? That way people understand that, you know, just because we go to 1.1 doesn't necessarily mean you have to jump up to 1.1 because 1.0 is still fully compatible. If you don't need the extra features of 1.1, then you're perfectly okay sticking with 1.0. I mean, would additional text like that help or would it run the risk of potentially saying the wrong thing and then being inconsistent with Semver itself? Because I don't like duplicating text. Okay, not hearing anything. I'm not gonna add unless someone says so. Okay, so take your time, think this over. Um, it will still be on the agenda for next week. I don't think we're necessarily in a huge rush, but obviously before we get to 1.0, we need to make you know, this kind of a decision going forward. Um, so anything else on this topic before we move on? Okay, in that case, technically at the end of the agenda, are there any of these other PRs out there that are actually ready that I've missed? Because I don't think any of them are technically ready. Okay. Are there any other topics that people would like to bring up for discussion at all on today's call? Uh, hi, hi, Doug. Yes. Hello. Uh, this is Mao Hiro. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about the uh, workflow subgroup meeting. Uh, I put my question in the minute above. And I got the uh, calendar update schedule by email today. And, uh, the update is just uh, time. The, the starting time is just shifted to 30 minutes or something. And I'm just wondering, are we going to have a meeting in next week? Oh, that's an excellent. Well, I'm sorry. You, I, I had a very hard time hearing you. I think my, my connection is really bad. Are you ask, you're asking whether we're going to have a meeting next week, correct? Yes. Yeah, I, I assumed we were going to have one. Is there something going on that would make us not have a meeting next week? Okay. I'm not aware of any no, events that would cause us. I know the OSS Summit in, in Scotland is going on, but um, I didn't think that was worthy of, of canceling the meeting. Okay, so Nehara, I, I think we will have a meeting next week. I'm not hearing anybody mention some reason not to. Okay, and, and what kind of things are we going to discuss? Um, I don't know yet. I'm assuming we may talk about the versioning scheme. Um, we'll have the, the result of the property casing discussion. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm asking the teleconference of the uh, workflow subgroup. Oh, the workflow subgroup. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Kathy, would you like to talk about that? Because we haven't had a weekly meeting for the workflow subgroup for, for quite some time. So, I, I don't think there's going to be one next week for the workflow. That's because I got a, a calendar update by email today. Oh, that was supposed to be a cancellation notice. Oh, I see. Yeah, that uh, because I actually I apologize. I misunderstood what you were saying. I can't remember the, the person's name. I think the person's name is Taylor, the uh, one of the CNCF sort of administrative people. They pinged me yesterday asking whether they should remove the workflow 
subgroup uh, calendar invite? And I said, yes, because we were not doing a regular meeting anymore. So uh, maybe they made a mistake and they sent out a, a modification rather than a cancellation, but it was supposed to be a cancellation. I see. So uh, could you scroll the screen a little bit up here? I, I put a comment here. OK. Um, so no. Um, so Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, no call next week. We are only having calls um, on an as on an as needed basis. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, okay. So I I think for the work group that draft, I think we still need to um, go through it, and there are some er I saw some errors there. Um, so maybe in the after the uh, Coop come Shanghai. I'm going to go through it then, you know, post uh, new PRs to correct those things. And other people are welcome to go through it and then, you know, poor issues or, you know, poor PRs. Yeah. But just as a point of process, is that being managed in this group or is that a separate, a separate body? How's that functioning today? So now it's managed by this group, yeah. Um, previously, we had a separate subgroup meeting. Um, we have uh, then we reached some consensus on the first draft, and then we decided there is no need for you know that intensive meetings. So we're going to just uh, discuss it in as part of this group. But if needed, you know we can always have uh, you know another um, um, another meeting specifically on on the workflow draft. Okay, yeah, thanks. And, and to, thanks and to answer, and to, Jim, to answer your question from a broader perspective, if the workflow uh, specification that's being developed uh, becomes mature enough to warrant it being sort of a standalone entity, then I could see a new work group or whatever the proper word is for it uh, being initiated since the cloud events is focused just on the cloud event spec itself and the workflow sits on top of it. So it'd probably be a separate entity at some point in the future once it gets mature enough. Cool, this yeah. Is I, I thought it was something like that. And I think some of this is just the heritage of how this group it started up in the first place. You know, it's sort of, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually kind of funny if you think about it, right? Cause you got the workflow subgroup, which is under cloud events, which is technically still sort of under the serverless work group, even though they're somewhat separate entities, we have this kind of a weird relationship right now. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other topics we want to bring up? We have five minutes left. Okay, in that case, let's just quickly get the roll call stragglers. Uh, Jem, I heard you. Uh, Renato, are you there? Renato? Okay, what about- He is here with oh. yes, Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. And Lee? Uh, Lee, I, th I, saw, I thought I saw someone pop in the agenda or the uh, speaker queue with Lee, okay. Mike Place, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And which company are you with, by the way? Uh, I work on the uh, SaltStack project. I'm the maintainer there. Okay. So uh, do you actually represent them or do you just work them? I'm trying to, for, for attendance purposes, I try to associate people with a particular company for voting okay. rights. I, I do represent them, yes. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure. All right. Is there anybody else for the attendance that I missed? All right, cool. In that case, we are done. Thank you guys very much. And I'll talk again next week. And don't forget to vote, but please wait until I send out a note to, or a comment to the issue. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Bye.